In this video, we're going to look at something called redox chemistry. Redox is short for oxidation and reduction. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on that, but we do need to talk about a few things. One thing that you saw in the reactions practices was something called electrolysis. You had a reaction where water was uh, had an electric current put through it. What happens when we do that is we actually split water into hydrogen and oxygen. And if you look at the picture on the screen, see if you can tell which of the tubes contains the hydrogen and which one contains the oxygen. Hopefully you said the one on the right contains hydrogen because there's about twice as much gas in the one on the right as there is on the left. And you can see that for every oxygen molecule, there are two hydrogen molecules being made. So oxidation numbers, they describe the number of electrons that are associated with an atom. They don't really have a physical meaning for the most part, but they're an electron bookkeeping method. And so we're going to look at how we do that. So these are the rules. Write them down to find oxidation numbers. Every uncombined element in its natural state has an oxidation number of zero. So something like silver, Ag, or oxygen, its natural state is O2, a diatomic molecule, those would have an oxidation number of zero. When you have a monatomic ion, remember that mo the mono part means one, so an ion that consists of one atom, that oxidation number is going to be its charge. The next rule tells us that fluorine in a compound is always negative one. Hydrogen, when it's in a compound, is usually positive one, but when it's a compound that's a hydride, it's going to be negative one. That's because it's in a compound with typically a metal, and so it has to have a negative oxidation number. And then oxygen is almost always a negative two when it's in a compound, unless it's in a peroxide, like hydrogen peroxide, and then it's a negative one. And then the last rule is that the sum of all the oxidation numbers for each of the atoms in a species, so that would be a compound or an ion, is going to equal the overall charge of that thing. So if it's a compound, a compound is neutral, so it would the numbers added together would equal zero. But if it's an ion with a charge, you would set those oxidation numbers, the sum of those oxidation numbers, equal to the charge on that ion. So let's go through a few examples. This one's asking us to give, this is a typical problem, give the oxidation number of every element in the compound. So looking at this example, let's look at the elements in this compound that we know from our rules. So we, we don't really know anything about carbon yet. Fluorine, we know, is always a negative one in a compound, and hydrogen is usually a plus one unless it is a, uh, in a hydride, and this is not a hydride. I would, I would have to tell you the name and tell you that it was a hydride. We don't really know anything about the carbon, so we're going to have to use that last rule to figure it out. So what we need to do is we need to add up our oxidation number for our one carbon, and we're going to add it to the one from the hydrogen because hydrogen has an oxidation number of plus one and there's one atom here. And then we've got three fluorines and each of those has an oxidation number of negative one. And we're going to set that equal to the oxidation number. We're going to set that equal to the the charge of the species. That's our compound. Remember if it's a neutral compound, the charge on that is zero. And then we're just going to solve for C, so it's just algebra. So it's going to be plus 1 minus 3, so that's going to be C minus 2 is equal to 0. So the oxidation number for carbon is a plus 2. And that's how we find the one that we don't have information about in the rules. Let's try another one. All right, barium chloride. So look at your rules and see which ones you think might apply to this one. Hopefully you recognize that barium chloride is an ionic compound made of two monatomic ions, okay? So in that case, each one of the oxidation numbers on these compounds is its charge. 
So barium would be a 2 plus, and chloride would be a 1 minus. And so if we added those up, that would give us, again, a 2 plus plus 2 1 minuses would be 0, and that would be the charge on the overall neutral compound. Let's try another example. All right, so let's think about the ones that we know in this compound. This one's a little trickier. We know oxygen is usually a negative 2. This is not a peroxide. This is potassium nitrate. But you don't really have anything in your rule about the N, and there's nothing specific about K. But the rule about the monatomic ion applies. Remember that this is a potassium ion and a nitrate ion. Potassium is a monatomic ion. It's an ion from one element. So its oxidation number is going to be plus 1. Now nitrogen is the unknown, so we're going to do the same thing. We're going to add up all of the oxidation numbers in the whole compound, and we're going to set it equal to the charge on the compound, which of course is going to be 0 for this. Okay, so we have one potassium. We don't know what nitrogen is, but there's only one, so we're going to add that. And then we need to add 3 times negative 2. And so let's solve for n. So it'll be n minus 5 equals 0. And the 5, it's plus 1 minus 6, so that gives us neg negative 5. And then if we add 5 to both sides, n is equal to plus 5. So that would be our oxidation number for the nitrogen. Let's try another one. Okay, this one looks a little tricky. It's an ion. So remember that we're going to use what we know, and then we'll set what we don't, the rest of it, equal to the charge on our species. This is our species, this ion, and so it has a negative 2 charge. So let's look at we, what we know. There's nothing specific. This is uh, covalent, so the monatomic ion rule doesn't apply. But we know that oxygen is a negative 2. We don't know what S is, but we can set this whole thing equal to negative 2 because that's the charge on this species. So we've got two sulfurs, and then we're going to add 3 negative times negative 2, since that's the oxidation number on oxygen, and we're going to set that equal to a negative 2. So then that becomes 2S minus 6 equals negative 2. We're going to add 6 to both sides, so 2 times the oxidation number for sulfur is going to equal plus 4. And then if I divide that by 2 to get S by itself, the oxidation number on sulfur is going to be a plus 2. Let's take a look at another one. P4. That's an element by itself, and for phosphorus, this is its natural state. So the oxidation number for phosphorus in this situation would be zero. It's not in a compound, it's by itself. Something like O2 or N2 or H2 or Au for gold or Mg for magnesium, any of those would be zero because that's an uncombined element in its natural state. All right, this one looks a little bit trickier. Lots of atoms there that we're going to have to deal with. So let's take a look at what we know from our rules. Okay, we don't really know anything about nitrogen, but we know that hydrogen is usually a negative, I'm sorry, a positive one. We don't really know anything about carbon, but we know oxygen is usually a negative two. But we also know that this compound splits into two ions. And if you remember from the last example, we can use an ion and its charge to find the oxidation number of an element. So if we just look at uh, ammonium, ammonium is NH4 and it has a 1 plus charge. So let's use what we know about hydrogen, that it's a plus 1 and the fact that the ammonium has the 1 plus charge to see if we can find the oxidation number for nitrogen. So 1 nitrogen plus 4 times the plus 1 from each of the hydrogens, and we're going to set that equal to 1 plus because that's the charge on our species, that particular ion. So n plus 4 is equal to 1, 
And so we're going to go ahead and subtract 4 from both sides, and that's going to give us a negative 3. So now that we know n is negative 3, we can go ahead and use that with this entire compound to find the one that we don't know now, which is carbon. So if you look, we can just add up all the atoms in this uh, whole compound, which is a lot. It's going to be a pain. But let's go ahead and do it. We've got two nitrogens, so 2 times negative 3. And then we've got 2 times 4, so 8 hydrogens that are each a plus 1. And then we've got 2 carbons, which we don't know. That's our unknown. And then we've got four oxygens, which have an oxidation number of negative two. And the charge on this whole species, this compound, is zero. So let's go ahead and solve this. So we have negative six plus eight plus two C minus eight is equal to zero. Now the plus eight and the minus eight will just cancel out. So now I'm left with negative six plus two C equals 0. And so I can add 6 to both sides and I get 2C equals 6. So one carbon is going to be a plus 3 oxidation number. So that one's not too bad. It's not as bad as it looks. We'll go over some more of these in class. Vanadium is an interesting transition element we find in the middle of the periodic table. Vanadium can go through multiple oxidation states. Its ions can have different charges. And we'd like to show you that. Here we've poured off some water from a zinc mercury amalgam and placed it in this large Erlenmeyer flask. Here we have the ammonium metavanidate solution, which we notice is yellow in color when vanadium is in the plus 5 oxidation state. As we add the plus 5 vanadium to the catalyst, stoppering the flask, agitating it slightly, we see it changing to a green color. If we continue to agitate it and allow the reaction to proceed further, we notice a blue color appearing. This would be the vanadium in the three positive oxidation state. And finally, with a great deal of agitation, allowing the vanadium in the plus three to come in contact with the catalyst, the zinc mercury amalgam, after vigorous shaking, we see that the vanadium has changed from the three positive in the blue to the two positive, which is the violet color. So let's look at some uses for oxidation uh, reduction reactions, that flow of electrons. One thing that we all like is our car. We like to be able to go places, and cars use batteries to do that. And that is the way that the battery works is it causes electrons to flow. And that comes from a redox reaction. That's the movement of electrons from one element to another. And so you can see that car batteries usually have sulfuric acid in them. Uh, if you ever go to have your battery changed, the person doing that will usually put on some safety glasses and gloves and maybe even an apron to protect themselves because they can get the acid on themselves. But you can see that uh, through that reaction of the lead 4 oxide plus lead plus sulfuric acid, those electrons are able to move around to make the battery useful for your car. We also like alkaline batteries. Those are used in lots of things like smoke detectors and flashlights. And you can see that they have a, a positive end called a cathode. Remember cations are positive ions. It has that same cat uh, prefix. And anodes, the negative end, uh, like anion, negative ion. So the anode is the negative end. And again, that flow of electrons is what causes the alkaline batteries to provide the energy that our things need. Electroplating is actually pretty cool. What happens is you hook 
a lump of whatever metal you're going to plate with. So if your mom or your grandmother has a, a silver plated tray or a silver plated hairbrush or something like that, it's something underneath like a stainless steel or something like that with a really thin layer of silver on top. So it looks like it's all silver, but it's actually a really thin layer. And that comes from this process of electroplating. So you hook up this hunk of silver or whatever metal it is to a power source and then you run a current through that power source from the metal through the power source to whatever it is you're trying to plate, in this case a spoon. And what happens is the electrons are pulled from the silver and that forms silver ions. You'll remember that silver ions are soluble in water so they go into this electroplating solution. And then as the electrons move around to the item that's being electroplated, they become, the item becomes kind of negatively charged, which attracts those silver ions. That becomes that attractive force to, to get those silver ions to come close, and they form that really thin silver layer, layer on top of the item. Another thing that comes from uh, oxidation and reduction reactions is rust. If you've ever gotten yelled at for leaving something metal out in the rain like your bike, the reason that happens is when you leave water on iron or steel, it forms this 2 plus ion, and the ion reacts with the oxygen in the air to form iron 3 oxide, which is what we know as rust. So the electrons are leaving the iron atoms to form iron ions, which causes that reaction, which is rust. So it's just kind of interesting to know what those reactions are and how they work.